All right. Scarlett. Yes. Scarlett, oh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio. Uh-huh. I'm the youngest of five. Um, it was a nice place to grow up, I guess. It was just like any other place, I guess. But I had kind of a rougher childhood than most people. In what ways? My mom was an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic. My stepdad was abusive. And um, I grew up way too soon. My mom was a, she molested me at the age of five, but my mom had multiple personality disorder. So she didn't know she did it. And um, I never told. So. So you were born male? Male. But you're trans now? Uh huh. When, when did you? My whole life I always felt like I was different than everybody else. I knew that there was something, I, I like to say special, more special about me than them, but I like, 12 turning 13, I told my parents, my mom saw me, I was crying. <clears throat> she said she'd rather have a gay son than a dead one. And I told her that I, you know, I felt like it was a woman inside and started the process. Do you think the sexual abuse in your childhood kind of directed you that way? Or no, no. Was something you were born with? I, yeah, I've always felt like I was different. And it's not, it had nothing to do with that. Now, it turned me hypersexual, like the sexual abuse when I was younger. I. I got into prostitution and, and started having sex at like 10. Really? So yeah. 10 years old? 10 years old. Wow. You finished school? I got my GED in prison. What were you in prison for? Um, prostitution in Texas. Any three of the same misdemeanors becomes an automatic felony. And that was a prostitution, you were dressed as a male or a female? I was a female. I've lived my life as a female since I was 13. Oh, since 13. Okay. And how old are you now? I am 42. 42. So you moved to L.A. at what, at what point? Ten years ago. Um, my husband and my mom passed away three hours apart. Wow. So I moved down here. Tell me how L.A. is different than Texas. For a trans woman? Uh, LA is more accepting. They don't care. You can walk down the street in a thigh high boots and a little mini skirt and nobody's bats an eyelash. In Texas, they're gonna throw rocks at you. But it's Texas is more, you know, conservative. It's on how you carry yourself. People when I got here, I was shocked at it was a culture shock for me. Cause in Texas people are so polite, you know, they say Good morning, you pass by, they open the door for you, things like that. Here, it's just like, it seems like everybody's out for themselves. But in a way, I needed that because I was so busy thinking about everybody else over there that I did nothing for myself until I got here. And drugs are a part of your life or no? Yes. They've been a part of my life since I was 13. Wow. At first, it was just to get away from everything, to stop. Um, then when my husband passed away, I, um, I couldn't take the pain. So I did as much as I could, anything I could. I did um, heroin, coke, crystal. I did it all in one day. Trying to kill myself, I guess. Didn't find no reason to live. Stupid. I'm still addicted to him, but it's I can control it a lot more now than I could before. Because before I couldn't control it, I was. I, as much as I could do and as little time possible. And now I just, it's not the main thing I think about when I wake up anymore. The death of your husband kind of set you on that path? He started me on heroin, yeah. Oh, he started you? He started me. Well, when he died, it started me on heroin. Oh, I see. Not, because not. He, um, he did heroin before, and I was just smoking crack and stuff in Texas. And when he died, it was like, Like, no pain I'd ever felt before in my life. Like, you never want to feel again. He was the love of your life. No. He was just one of them. I was blessed with somebody else who, he, oh, he used to tell me, girl, because he used to call me Red, my, I'm, not just, I'm a natural redhead. He used to tell me, Red, you're going to find that guy out there that's going to put up with your bullshit. And 
You know, he's, you're going to give it right back to him. And he was talking about Tony. And it just, it happened so abruptly. He was uh, hit by a car. Tossed him 75 feet in the air. It broke every bone in his body. And then my mom died three hours after that. She lost her fight to cancer. And it was like completely dark in my life. I didn't think about it. my whole life, my whole childhood, everything that I went through. I always kept like this thought in the back of my head because my mom always said, if you're faithful to God, if you're true to God, if you believe in his word, he's gonna come through. But when everything happened to me when I was a kid, where was he then? I asked when they passed away, I asked myself, where was God then when, when I was getting raped, when I was getting beaten, when, uh, where was he then? And then I lost my family, my mom and my husband, and it was like the most, it shook my faith, it shook my faith in God. I found it again, but it's just, it's hard. Every day is hard. How do you support yourself now? I'm prostituting still. Mm. Yeah. I um, was 14, well, I'm sorry, I was 16, and living in San Antonio. And my mom, I was working at KFC. And I would come down, I was living in New Braunfels, Texas. And we'd come down every weekend, because I always had the weekends off. And one weekend I had to work, and I sent my mom down, she got arrested. And I moved back down to San Antonio and I gave my dad this money to get me an apartment because my um, my godfather owned a set of apartments. And my dad gave me the money. I gave him the money, I'm sorry. And he put me in a motel room for the night and said, I'll come back for you in the morning. The next morning, the landlord's banging on the door, tells me I got to go. I threw all my clothes away at the place to prostitute in San Antonio's Broadway. I stepped foot on Broadway and I popped my first lick. I've been doing it ever since. It's like, I got addicted to the money, not the lifestyle. I was poor growing up. I suffered and I wanted, I went to bed hungry. And since I started prostituting, I never ever had to do that again. So. Tell me about the guys who pick you up. They're different. <laughs> it's, some of them are real, um, most of them are bottoms. <laughs> I, I'm, my ad says I'm a TS top, so. That's what I so, do. So for those that don't know what that means, that, that means you're... I am fully functional and I still use my penis. <laughs> Does it mean you're more, you're more dominant as well? Yes. Yeah. To some, to some, depending on what they want or how they act, within like first five minutes of conversation with one of them, I already know what they want. But they're getting a different person. They're not getting the, the real me. They're not, no, they never get to see the real me. They couldn't handle it. So what they get is a version of what they want. Their conversation tells me what they want, and I become that person. When you say they couldn't handle the real you, what, what qualities do you have that would make it difficult for people to handle? I'm not as much of a bitch as people think. I'm real sensitive. Excuse me. I'm real sensitive. <clears throat> and I wasn't raised to be that way. Um, in my family, you had to be tough. Thank you. You had to be tough. You had to. My mom was like, she was like mean. My mom would, first time I ever got my, my got beat up when I was younger, my mom backed me into a corner. She put on boxing gloves and she boxed me until I fought back. People, a lot of my friends think I'm the strongest person in the world and I'm not. I'm not. I don't have all the answers for everybody else. I can fix everybody else's problems but my own. I cause more harm to myself than I do to anybody else. And um, why, I don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. What emotions do you struggle with most? Um, forgiveness. <laughs> That's the hardest thing for me to do. <laughs> because I see the people that victimize me and they're living great lives. <laughs> then it pisses me off because how could they know? 
They took something from me. And now they're living in nice houses with their families. They took away my childhood, my innocence. And just threw me aside. Then the state victimized me by not doing them to them what they should have done to them. You know, everybody, you pay for everything in life. Eventually, if not in this life, you'll pay for it in the next. But forgiveness is the hardest emotion I have to deal with because I don't want to take that hate and that anger with me when I go. When I go to meet my maker, I just call God. I don't want to have hate or anger in my heart. I don't want to be that type of person. Now I wish them no harm. I hope their kids and their families are healthy and happy, but I hope they never forget that they did it off my blood, sweat, and tears. Forgiveness is something you do for yourself, not for someone else. Yeah, and I think forgiving myself is the hardest thing because I felt like I should have told people. No, but forgiving others is something you do for yourself. Oh, I can forgive others. <laughs> it's, real, it's, it's weird. It's the same thing, whether you're forgiving others or yourself. I can't forgive myself because I felt like I should have spoke out more. I should have pulled back. My mom had cancer. My brother, I'm the youngest of five. And they all just abandoned her. I had to stay there and deal with it all. Like, I, you know, they didn't, they, with, my mom was a drunk. She was a bad drunk. And she, at that, she was a violent drunk. So they didn't have to deal with any of it. They all took off and left. Yeah, I stood there and I dealt with it. When a five year, you know, I have to hold a mirror under my mom's nose to see if she's alive because I'm afraid that the state's going to come and take me away again at five years old. Please, that's no way to live. Poor. And then they throw you into some type of youth home and that's even worse. Because you get this sense of like you feel abandoned and they don't show you how to deal with that throughout the rest of your life. I've never felt loved before in my life. Not as a kid, not as an adult. What about your husband? I believe he loved me. He had love for me, but he wasn't in love with me. I was, I think he, um, Weta wanted to, uh, I was the party girl. He was nerdy and he wanted that life. I provided it for him. I fell in love with him. I felt like God punished me for that. Like, just when I reached what I thought was love, God took it away from me. So, with Tony, I'm afraid God's going to take it away. So I'm a bitch. Because it's easier. Because I couldn't take it if God took him away. Do, do you feel like life is unfair? No. Not for me. I made my choices. Everything I did, I did it. I made the choice. I am where I am because I made these choices. Not anybody else. Nobody put a gun to my head and told me to shoot up. Nobody put a gun in my head and told me to go suck a dick. Nobody did any of that. I made the conscious choice to do it myself. And there was people who tried to pull me out the lifestyle. There were, I met some great people along the way. My friend Shonda. I would walk from here to San Antonio if she needed me. She, her and her family showed me unconditional love for the first time in my life. She was there for me when nobody else was. Through my suicide attempts, through the countless ODs and stuff like that. Because if I was going to do it, I was going to do it hard, so I didn't know how to do a little bit of dope. I would slam it all in. Why, why do you think such a high percentage of transgender women are, are sex workers? Because who's going to hire us, honestly? We could be when transsexuals, we walk out in the world, especially, I hate to say this because it's going to sound ugly, but the girls that are passable have it harder than the girls that are not passable. Because when the girls, the girls that are not passable, somebody sees them, they say, oh, they know what they are. So they're going to cuss, maybe, da, da, da. The girls that are passable, 
they have it harder because guys don't know what we are. So when they see us coming down the street and they feel like we fooled them, they want to hurt us. They want to hit us. They want to beat us, shoot us, rape us. They want to do something to extinguish our light because they feel like we fooled them. But we didn't fool them. We're just living our lives. I feel like the gay and lesbian community, they forget about the transsexuals. The, the GLBTQ, whatever, they leave the transsexuals out. They don't understand our struggle because they, we're not gay. Transsexuals aren't gay. We feel like we're women. We know we're women. So they kind of like, trans rights are really important. They're really, really important. I've lost a lot of friends. I've had friends die when they didn't have to die. I had a friend who was put in an incinerator when she didn't have to be. If, you know, people were more educated in school and stuff like that. But then there's a lot of transsexuals that need to stop doing what they do too. Stop trying to fool a guy. Stop trying to get a straight boy. You know, it doesn't all matter. It, find somebody that loves you. Find somebody that you love. It doesn't matter what they look like or who they are or what's between their legs. Just find out who they are. Look past. Beauty's only skin deep and you're never going to look beautiful forever. So. What are you afraid of? What are you worried about? Honestly, everything that could possibly have happened to me has happened to me already. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to meet my maker. <laughs> I don't want to, but I'm not afraid. I have no fears. I figure this life was bad, the next one will be better. Hopefully. And if not, maybe I'll come back as a butterfly or something. If you had your life to live all over again, what would you have done differently? Hmm. Nothing. Nothing. I like who I am now. I have a lot of love in my heart for everybody. For people I don't even know, I have love for them because I know what pain feels like. And nobody should have to feel that. And besides, along my journey to get here, I met some really amazing people. I met some really sad people, but I met some really amazing people along the way too. And I wouldn't want to change that for anything. What's been your lowest point? Losing my mom and my husband. I um, tried to kill myself twice. Didn't happen. <laughs> um, that was my lowest point. That's when I thought it was so dark. And then my sister-in-law, Barbie, I was at a Goodwill with a friend of mine and I saw her and her and her kids saved my life. I needed a family so bad. They invited they invited me into their family, to be their family. They saved my life. They and Shonda. How big a part of your current situation is your drug addiction? It's not that big. When my drug, I mean, I do drugs, but... What do you, what do you use mostly? Crystal um, meth? No, I like fentanyl. Hmm. But I was doing heroin before fentanyl. I used fentanyl to get off of heroin and then got stuck doing fentanyl. So it was like a double-edged sword for me. I was tired. Of, I was doing heroin for 12 years from the day my husband died to the day I found fentanyl. And um, for some strange reason, my body just like adapted to it. I can smoke a mass amounts of it and nothing happens to me. But I've seen friends drop dead off of just like one hit. And... Um, I used heroin to numb the pain, but fentanyl doesn't numb the pain. If anything, it amplifies it. I used to think it was hereditary. My mom was addicted to Xanax. My dad used to do speed. So, and they were both alcoholics. And I drink, I'm an alcoholic. I do drugs. 
But I went from having like about a $1,500 habit to like down to having a $40 habit, which is pretty good for me. Baby steps. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you have people in your life that you trust? No. No. That's, that's sad. Yeah. But the people that are in my life right now, they're, um, they were taught, I come from a different world than, than they do. They've never, they, how do I say it without sounding ugly? They've never had anything. So when they see something they want, they're, they don't, hell and high water is going to keep it from it. And no matter who they hurt in between, I can't be that way. I'm not like that. I care about people's feelings and I don't like hurting people because I know what it feels like. I don't want to inflict that on anybody else ever again. Where do you stay now? Bah, different places. We're, in a, we're, we're staying in a tent now. We tried out when that project room key came through, me, we signed up for it, never heard back from the people. Um, what's that, Lassa? The lady from Lassa, she would come by every other weekend and tell us, oh, I got a, a place for you, da 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 I'll be here next week, and then she would never show up. I think she's came by like maybe four times in the last year. So they never helped us get into any of those projects, Project Room Key or anything like that. But I think it's because we're trying to stay together that they're just like, and a lot of places don't want to, like those, those, Things don't want to take transsexuals. They don't want us to go there because we pose security risks or problems with the other guests. And I understand that, but don't exclude us either because there's a lot of transsexuals living on the streets right now. Do you believe in karma? Yeah, very much so. How does karma play out in your life? Well, I must have been really evil in my last life. Maybe Hitler or Stalin or something because I've suffered for 10 lifetimes in this one. So my next one, hopefully I'll be something better. I'll get a better life. Maybe not try to help so many people when I can barely help myself. Scarlett, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Love. That's the most important lesson. To love myself, to love other people. To show kindness, compassion, to care. Not just about myself, but about people I don't even know. Because if this world's ever gonna change, we gotta do it one person at a time. So I'm going to be kind and love everybody I can. All right, Scarlett, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're (laughs) welcome. Wish you the best of luck out there.